and help see how things go. There we go. We're live. Hey guys, welcome. Yeah, if you guys don't know, John and I were just talking about how I keep forgetting how it's three hours behind on the West Coast time and traffic hasn't even started yet. Did you guys have that thing? Like California got fucked pretty hard on COVID policy, same as like Ontario, right? It was it was bad. Uh, my sister came out and visited last year when we were still locked down. Yeah, she lives in Florida. And she was oh. kind of complaining about DeSantis and his approach to doing things. But then, uh, you know, a few days here, she was looking around and was like, oh, man, well, maybe it's not so bad. Like, maybe he's not <laughs> so bad keeping things open. Maybe, it might, yeah. maybe that was a good decision. Oh, it must be then. The one thing I will say that's nice that came out of this is because they'd locked down Ontario, traffic is gone. So, like, I, I live right near um, the stadium where the Blue Jays play. And it's like the main highway out of town. So every day at five, everybody's honking horns. It's the worst traffic in North America, which I know you're from LA, so you might argue with me. But that's all gone away. Like I hear birds and shit chirping outside. Yeah. Fair enough. LA traffic. So but uh, I've been there traffic can get not so good. And and we weren't the the traffic wasn't like lifted for that long. Really? I I I feel like you know, I feel like, I don't know. It didn't take that long for for people to be sneaking <laughs> out, going places. Like, they weren't going to uh, their soul-sucking job, you know, because they're working from home. But they were they were going to hiking trails and other shit, and, like, there's still traffic out. Oh, that's why California is so much smarter than us Ontarioans. Everybody was just going to the park and drinking in the park like a hobo. <laughs> People uh, did that too. People did that oh. too. I have my friends who had a, a weekly uh, park, get drunk at the park deal. Nice. It's kind of how funny is that? <laughs> I'm well enough off in life. I can act like a homeless man. Yeah. <laughs> you can be homeless for an afternoon. That's the real <laughs> flex. Yeah. They, they walk out of the park with their with their chairs and their coolers and uh, charcuterie chairs and um, their dogs. And they Dude, the and they get hammered. You're the only other guy I know that knows what a charcuterie board is. <laughs> no, I honestly I love this. I, I was like making rants. I, I only I only know because I have friends that make them or have them. Well, I know that I mean, it's, everybody knows. It's just you put some cheese on a plate, right? But I enjoy that because nobody would argue, and I know it's like the masculinity thing, but nobody would argue that John, you're not a man's man. You can fight. You look hot as fuck. Like you're jacked. Uh, you know, you did the family thing. Like, there's nothing about you that doesn't have 100% man stamped on it with, like, that Angus beef sticker. But that you can, like... I know exactly what knife a cheese knife is. I don't know what it is. It just warms my heart because I lately I've been ranting on Twitter. Have you seen these where it's, like, masculine of, of excellence accounts? Five ways to be a man, and they show, like, Don Draper in a suit, and they talk about <laughs> real men smoke whiskey and and drink pot and... They don't touch video games and all they do all day is work hard yeah. to impress their wives and shit. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, and it's just nice because you're there. It's like, I'm in California. Weed is legal. I'm having a charcuterie board. Charcuterie board. Fuck off. <laughs> the, male, the male excellence uh, go bag. It's like exactly. A big picture of Don Draper. Bottled whiskey. Oh, and they're ridiculous. Now, thank you very much for that comment, Marty. But I guess I kind of... So the... There's two reasons that I had you on here. One, I realize we've been talking for like a year and I don't know nearly enough about you because you're interesting as fuck. I don't know if people know your story, but I realize we've been talking for like, oh, oh, you got some echo on there. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Like you went to war with the UFC and it sounds like you're winning because you were telling me, was it last week that you just, uh, that the class action just made some like forward progress, right? Well, the class action we've been waiting for. Uh, the judge to write out his decision on uh, class certification for like over yeah, a yeah. year. But one thing that we've noticed is the new contracts with the UFC's offering uh, other fighters have sunset clauses now. So they're like five year sunset clause. And that was not something that ever was a piece of uh, the deal before. Like people have talked recently about how like GSP is still technically under contract with the UFC. And can I just take a moment though? That's crazy. Not right. that not that that it wasn't there before, but that it it happened so quickly. Just come you guys fighting because music they're, they're, industry they're screwed over. Of, 
losing billions of dollars. Yeah, but like the music industry was too when they were like, yeah, we'll sign on young guys, get them on super long contracts, screw them over. They never changed in 50 years. You guys managed to get that to manage to hurt them where it hurts in like the last five. And I know this has nothing to do with what we're talking about. I just find it interesting. Plus, I love when people stick it to like big companies or like, yeah, you know, I got a billion dollars. What do you got? It's like, I just don't give a fuck anymore. Let's go. Yeah, <laughs> yep. And uh, yeah, man. They would have loved to have bought us off with, uh, you know, fifty thousand dollar backroom bonus for a fight, but that wasn't it. Wasn't enough. It, like you could see the money coming in, you could see the shit they're spending money on. You yeah, see well, the, yeah, you guys should have made way more than that. The disrespect from the promoter to the athlete didn't make any <laughs> sense to me at all. So here's my question to you: compared to how boxers were treated. And UFC guys are treated. Do you guys think who do you guys who do you think had it worse, boxers or UFC guys? Well, here's the interesting fact with boxing is mm -hmm. that in the late 1800s, the U.S. government said that it was a conflict of interest for promoters to hold exclusive contracts and control the belt and rankings. This really, too much, too strong-handed into one direction. It wasn't sportsly, sportsmanly, huh. whatever. So. They gave the titles over to the athletic commissions, the state athletic commissions. But then that became a conflict of interest also because the biggest states had the biggest budgets, had the biggest belts, could pay the most. So all the all the best promoters and all the best um, fighters would go to one state, which is New York, in mm -hmm. order to um, compete, which which is a fair competition. And then that, that created a lot of... Um, gangster uh interference and stuff like that because they had so much power right so in 1926 they created the uh sanctioning body license so they created a third party that could control the belt control the title and its only job was to control the title mm -hmm. and that's where the wbc wba those those big titles i think the big four derived from so Boxing has had independent titles, independent rankings since at least oh, yeah, for like 100 early, years plus. Early 1900s, years. yes, almost 100 years. So technically, there's a lot of corruption that happens within boxing, but like they've had a they've had a better better option. It's been better for them because they've had more choice because of that fact that that the, the promoters don't control contracts and titles. Yeah, well, I think it's because people don't realize like UFC is big right now, but it's still new. Like I still remember in college, remember mm -hmm. like the single digit UFCs mm -hmm. back when it was just Royce Gracie wanted to show off how great he was before. <laughs> yeah, before I. Uh, oh, yeah, I know this is before your that, time, which thank God, because some of the that. shit I saw there, man. Oh, I, I remember like I, it was the first like, UFC three was like, the first one we paid and watched like for my friend's basement and um like it was cool, but I never thought that I would ever try it because there's no weight classes and you know, they weren't wearing gloves or anything like that. And I like I've 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 rolled around with with shitty heavyweights before. <laughs> like that's, you know, and it's like, like yeah. I've rolled Dude, around they're with so sloppy. Yeah, like I've rolled around with a sh shitty two hundred and seventy pound kid before. Like, I don't want to fight that guy. Like well, it's not that, did, especially like you were at least were, exp I guess maybe not at the time, but like at the time when I was first starting in MM MMA, I trained with uh, Adam Zujek in Victoria, BC. It was a lot of fun. He's a really good trainer. Sarah Kaufman used to train under him. Mm -hmm. And because I weighed like 195 pounds, he put me with a plus 200 club and there was this 250 pound guy. Mm -hmm. And the problem with him is because he was learning too. his weight as a weapon, but he had no balance. He used to land on oh, me man. so hard, just putting me in like a guard that it hurt my ribs to the point where I couldn't sleep because it hurt to breathe. And I, like, I, I don't think I, this is why I'm amazed that you can be an MMA fighter because just like the, the, the years of training I did, there wasn't a week that went by where I wasn't in pain. <laughs> and I'm like, was he in pain that entire time? <laughs> like for that, for that couple year period there where you were professional fighting, how much of that time did you spend with like chronic something pain? I started wrestling in the in in the fourth grade. I was nine years old. 
Oh, and so you've been in pain since you were, so you were early exactly. enough to walk. <laughs> I, had, I had a buddy. Uh, so Bobby Southworth, he was on the first Ultimate Fighter. He he, used to, he was a little bit older than the rest of us at AKA at the time. And he had like just hit 30 or whatever. And he used to say all the time, like, just wait till you hit 30. Just wait till you hit 30. And I was like, man, I'm like, I'm, I'm sore all the time, every day already. <laughs> like, how is he going to get any worse? Like, ever since, uh, I'll, t- I'll tell you when it really started. Like, wrestling was fun until I was in seventh grade and I got to go for a week to the high school's practice. That was like right. two weeks of their practice before our, our official practices started. And me and uh, one of my friends got invited up to train with the the high school team for two weeks. And um, that's when I like I first saw what real training was. And like, mm-hmm. I was, fuck, I couldn't walk for like three weeks. It was awful. <laughs> but then it never ended. It just kept okay. going. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Like I actually had some, my childhood friend when I grew up, he, is, he was, uh, his parents were from Colorado. They were like a wrestling family. His dad was those guys who like taught me that cheap shit, like driving a knuckle into a guy's jaw, which hurts like shit. I don't know if you've seen, or he used to take the top of his head, put it in your solar plexus and just like squeeze big guy. His kid ended up, uh, not my friend, but his brother ended up going to the Olympics at like 17 and they were in pain all the time. That's why I just find the whole thing. Awesome. Having said that though, when you got a 300 pound Olympiad as like your little, as like your little brother, he got beat the shit out of all the time. And he was like 240 pounds, monster man, like mm-hmm. made out of steel. I don't know. The whole thing was funny. And this is going to segue into the topic. Cause if you guys don't know, we've been putting links out here. John is coming out with a course. And I like this one actually, cause when you're telling me about it, cause it's basics. Mm-hmm. And I don't think basics. a lot Super of guys basic. know basics. Like for example, um, Ed Lattimore and I were talking about like guys who can fight don't want to fight because yes. you find out that skulls are hard and you can break your hand just by punching somebody in the face. So mm-hmm. most guys who know how to fight know that and aren't looking forward to it. And I don't think a lot of guys know like simple basic shit like that. I don't know if that not punching in the head is part of your course or not, but. <laughs> well, I know this course is mostly like a positional and um, like the first technique is like if somebody, somebody grabs your wrist even know oh. if somebody grabs your wrist super uh day one level stuff but most people have no idea uh, there's a technique called a wrist roll it's very simple rolling yep. your your hand to their thumb because the thumb is very weak i can grab my nine-year-old's wrist pretty hard and he can still wrist roll out of it but most people have no idea how to escape like somebody grabbing the wrist and they end up pulling yeah. away real hard looking silly falling down wasn't well, that why all this shit matters though because if you don't know what you're doing and you don't know how to deal with it you kind of panic and then yes. when you panic you do something stupid yes and, and man knowing what you're doing in the first place usually is enough you carry yourself with a certain swagger and people yeah. will more than likely leave you alone and if you don't, if you have no idea what you're doing, and you're walking around all nervous, you're a target. Yeah. Well, that's actually, that's broke. The science has proven that much. There's a great book by uh, David Dutton. I always talk about it. Wisdom of Psychopaths. Have you heard of this one? No. Um, it had to do with the study where they, they film people walking. Yeah. You know yeah. the one, you know, the study. It takes what? It th- what was it? eight seconds three seconds something it was like very some fast. super small amount like that yeah yeah and then i gotta eat this olive that's you gotta do a martini unless you eat the olive very professional yeah where there's a bunch of psychopaths that were in prison like functional like documented psychopaths not just like i have a gluten intolerance but i'll eat muffins if you're not looking at me <laughs> like real psychopaths and they were yeah, violent criminals yeah, like violent criminals, and they go. They showed like a bunch of videos of people walking, and they were like, "Okay, which one of these guys look like the easy targets?" And they all were like, one hundred percent in lockstep, which guys they'd pick to fuck with. Yep. And it was just hilarious because I was thinking about this, and it's like it kind of reflects my experience too. Because I'm, I'm, I call myself like Mini Joe Rogan, not because I'm funny, but just because I have a lot of similar stuff. Like I had a black belt in Taekwondo, tried MMA for a while. I didn't get on any like fancy sitcom or uh have a comedic career but you know what i'm saying and then 
that reflected it too. Like a lot of guys in my redneck town love to fight and pick fights with me all the time. And then I learned how to fight a little bit. And then it just never happened anymore. Nobody tried picking a fight with me. And I realized it was just because I didn't look like that bitch over there that looked like he was probably easier to fuck with. And this is why I actually like, I, I mean, I really like the idea. And you're, I know you kind of undersell it, which is the, John, can I just say this is like, can I say a friend? Can I as a friend? You undersell yourself <laughs> way too much. I mean yeah. this, like, dude, and I know, I, I know you're in LA, so you're like, I've been fluffed before, fucking thanks. But dude, you see the shit you post. There's like, most people, arguably, everybody's like, GSP is the top of the thing. And then you show like stat by stat. They're like, holy shit, John's like right there. <laughs> Yeah. It's uh and here's a Canadian reference for you. Do you know who Terry Fox is? No. Okay, Terry Fox no. is this guy. He lost a leg and uh he ran across Canada to raise awareness for cancer and all that shit. He made the Terry Fox Foundation. Everybody thought it was awesome. Holy shit, that's a great. Here's the thing, and I'm trying to remember his name, and this is kind of why the story is uh there's another guy, and I can't remember his name right now, which sucks, but this you'll see why I can't remember his name. Terry Fox never finished the cross-country run. There was this other guy who did finish it, but he never got any notoriety. He never got, like, the Terry Fox Foundation. He never got all the shit, like, there. And that guy was, like, pissed. And I don't know why, but that's all I could think of right now on this one is, like, dude, like, you, if, if, this is, like, you're, like, the Mark Messier of MMA, and you're very chill about it, which is fucked <laughs> because take all the fighters, Chuck Liddell, Randy Couture. You can see my age, obviously Forrest Griffin, all these guys. And you're just like, yeah, I'm about, I'm about, I'm right in there, but yeah, yeah whatever. You know what I mean? So, and I, I hate to say it, but you got to get a little more of that MLD John bragging shit about you because <laughs> you've done a little bit more than buy a Versace and go to Japan. <laughs> <laughs> But and that's the thing. This course is you sitting there. It's like, guys, look. Mm -hmm. No, I had to. I, so I struggled with this course because how I, I, I'm making it basic. And I'm yeah. like, is this too silly for people? Is this silly? But I tested it on, you know, random people and some of the girls I had dates with. And it was really good. They got really excited about what I was showing them. Yeah. So if you guys are tentative, tentative of, uh, getting into a martial art or trying anything, this should be a very easy win for you. And if anything, you can learn this and uh, use it to pick chicks up. But hey, would you know what to do if somebody crabbed you like this? <laughs> what would you do You're if I started cool. choking you right now? <laughs> what would you do? I like that one. <laughs> but no, the wrist thing, like that's such an and that's weird because I like kind of took that for granted. I remember that my guy taught me it's like the space in between your your thumb and your finger. That's the weakest part of the grip. And but a lot of guys don't know this. And the it's reason I stopped watching MMA, which I don't know, this is kind of embarrassing, but I used to love watching it. It was I stopped right about the time that you started getting in there, not because I didn't like the sport, but because at the time I was in the military still, and it used to be like MMA was niche. The only people who watched were people yep. who really liked it. They usually trained. Like a lot of guys I knew were actually like amateur fightists. Yeah. And then once I started fight. seeing the guys who watched football on the weekends with fucking pot bellies opining about what the ref should have done, starting to watch UFC, it turned me off the whole thing, which really sucks. Mm -hmm. But I have a feeling that's why you guys were supposed to get a bunch of money at that point because the normies were watching it. I, well, I guess that's a win for you. <laughs> when the when they when the girl when the women started showing up to the fights in groups of fours and sixes and eights by themselves with no guys and and they didn't know who was fighting on the card, that's when I knew it was like, okay, it's been it's been normie washed. <laughs> normie the, washed, uh, that's the perfect word washed. for it. Yeah. And then the uh and the UFC especially, they they cultivated a very pro wrestling fan base. There's like almost a, 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 a perfect overlap of pro wrestling and MMA fans because of oh, dude, who, UFC fans. Dude, you're right. And I can't remember who was it that started it. I know everybody says Brock Lesnar is what started it, but or, no, uh, it started or it Shamrock the, maybe the UFC doing business with WWE and like stealing their business model and and stealing their merchandising model. And they, they copied so much from 
so from what they did. I know. That's why, that's why what they're doing is illegal. That's why oh, fair enough. So it's not only it. that, it's also corporate <laughs> theft. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Ken Shamrock. Yeah, fair enough. I was actually, there was a Joe Rogan podcast where the guy, I can't remember who he had on there. It was some guy I've never seen before, but he was talking about how you guys started early, to early adopt. Early uh, fighters, a lot of those early fighters were, were shoot fighters and shooto, and they did pro wrestling stuff too. Yeah. You know, like. There's a lot of there's a lot of murky murky stuff in the early days of MMA, which is and I get it I get it because I used to I remember I was in Thailand and we went to go see because if you're in Thailand what's the there's two things you're gonna do right you're gonna go watch Lady Boys get drunk get drunk and watch Lady Boys and then go watch a Muay Thai fight and I remember they took us down to this warehouse it felt like Kumite by the way we were like come to Kowloon Walled City watch Kumite. <laughs> and I know they had to do it as a bit of a show. So the guys, the first couple rounds, they don't go hard. Yeah. They kind of mm -hmm. show off to the crowd, give them entertainment. And then I think it was round three when they actually start to fight after they've yeah. felt each other out. So I get there's a bit of a need to they entertain the, the audience crowd. there. Although yeah, to be fair, yeah. boxing had those like 30 second Tyson matches too. So I guess there's room for everything. I just, I do find it interesting to see how MMA kind of went more kayfabe do you know what K you know kayfabe yeah it's pro wrestling. It. yeah pro wrestling, pro wrestling. but it's it's not just pro wrestling it's kind of pro wrestling but you kind of have to still fight but play it up a little bit i at it, least the one thing i'm glad they, about what the fertitas and, and uh dana did was there was the there was a wwf back in the day the brawl for brawl for all or whatever oh it yeah the, it was the pro wrestlers but they put boxing gloves on them and they actually had real boxing matches I remember that, yeah. Yeah, it was like a tough man, basically. So that's basically what they did. It's like, hey, we're just do that. That's that's our new. It would sport. suck because I miss like the butterbean type stuff. But I mean, whatever. But the point, the point is here. The reason I like this is because a lot of guys might watch this and think like, I've watched three fights now. I think I know what I'm doing. I just got to shoot for the leg and you know, get them in a mount and then ground and pound. You're like, all right, let's slow it down here. Like here's a, here's how to get rid of a wrist, a wrist grab. Cause what happens? Most well, people first, don't fight, but like, you know, the little ones, like if a guy tries to fight. grab your shirt, like little yeah. escapes like that. If you, if you want to fight, if you're somebody who really likes to fight, I'll just like to throw down, bro. Go to the fucking gym, go to the gym, <laughs> sign up for a smoker or uh the amateur fight, do some MMA, do a jujitsu tournament. Like, if you're, if you want to fight, go do that. Yeah. Like, but out in the wild, <laughs> your day-to-day -day life, you should never be getting close to getting into a fight. Well, you yeah, but that's, the, that's using, what all waiting, avoiding. And most times somebody who gets in your face, like they don't really want to fight either. They just, they no, they just want to save their ego. They want to save their ego. They want to be heard, you know, like let them win, like agree with them, amplify whatever they the name they called you and uh let them walk away well that's the reason i like when you like learn to fight though because for a lot of those guys yeah they're probably scared they don't actually want to get in a fight but they aren't no bitch either and if you're confident and you know how to fight or simple things like i remember uh, i don't know if you got this one either i haven't i should have watched the course but they taught me this if somebody grabs here you just like put both your hands there and bend down you kind of put them in a weird wrist lock it was like this weird cheap shit i learned but little things like that, so you realize if a guy's gonna try to fight with you and show off like, to his buddies you know, or some, pokes uh, you in the finger, in the chest, but just handling that stuff, it gave me confidence <laughs> to where like, yeah, okay, I get it. Look, man, don't wanna fight you. Yeah, you're a man, you're a tough guy. Tell all your buddies how awesome you are and I, I apologized and we'll catch you later. But if it did go down, I had the confidence to handle myself. And I think that's what matters. Cause mm -hmm. if I didn't know what the fuck I was doing, I'd have been scared shitless. And the guy can know. sell if you're scared of shit. Listen, you'll probably be like, him, you might learn that from Seagal. That's the one. <laughs> wrist lock, keto. You joke, but it sucked. It hurt when it got put on me. <laughs> <laughs> no, my my buddy Mo, he took some keto and stuff like that, and they had those uh, Seagal wrist locks and things. And yeah, they were. Cute. <laughs> you're like, eh. They're cute, but it's like, it's like wrestlers. If we could like wrist lock each other while we're trying to hand fight and throw each other around, like I think we would do that. Oh yeah, your hands are moving around too fast. 
No. But yeah. people are drunk. Most guys that want to fight are drunk. It's usually, I was from a redneck town. So for me, I could always tell a fight was it, happening it, after it, the liquor usually, store yeah, closed. The bar, somebody's drunk or some emotional output, you know, the fight. Oh, yeah. Like, girl. You know what the, you know what the scariest words really to hear in the bar are? My boyfriend would kick your ass. And I'm like, ah, oh, fuck. <laughs> now, even if he doesn't want to fight, he's like, I got to her. She won't fuck me anymore. <laughs> oh, man. That's the worst. But little basic shit like that, like learning, just learning, just learning some basic fighting techniques. And then you got the confidence to de escalate. I think that would make a huge or, difference. Or, like, I like to teach. So I came up with, like, I have a bitch smash system. I have my own fighting system. Like, I came up with a little martial art, like Bruce Lee did. Yeah. Okay. And a lot of knowing how to fight is just knowing how to put yourself in the right position or the best position all the time. So you're always facing your opponent. You're always moving towards an objective. I think a lot of people end up learning a handful of moves and they don't really learn anything about fighting. They just learn a handful of moves. Oh, so I, tips I, put and tricks. Together, I put together my system. So you systematically like always know where you're objectively moving towards. Oh, dude, I'm not going to lie. This sounds like game. There's no tips and tricks to learn how to how to hit on a chick or to fight a guy. But here's a system like you can system. actually understand the why system. the hell you want to say this or why you want to yeah. do this. I find it fascinating. I'm not even making fun of it. I really do find yeah, it. That's fucking why fascinating. when I read uh, the game, Neil Strauss is the game. I was like, holy shit, this whole talking to women and this whole thing is just technique. Like, It's just <laughs> technique. I was like, oh, so it totally like vibes with what you already like, know. Poor layover. I was like, holy fuck. It's like, it's not, <laughs> it's not what you say. It's how you say it and when. <laughs> I would laugh sitting here watching John talk to a girl. <laughs> hey, I got to get back to my friends in a minute, but I got to ask you a question. Uh, if I put you in a, in a, if I put you in a leg lock here, would you try to get me in an ankle lock or would you try to just start? <laughs> I'm, I don't mean to poke. That's fun. No, I agree. It's like everything. I think everything, not just there, but like I learned it when I left the military, joined business, learned it when I tried to learn how to fight, learned it when I tried to talk to girls, all that shit It's making it systematic and making everything deliberate, like not so much just what you're learning, but why you want to know it. I think it's like a superpower. And there's very few good teachers like you and I have talked about this before, how got even like guys who are good at it sometimes suck at teaching it. Sometimes you are good at teaching. Sometimes suck at teaching a specific thing. Same, it takes a real thing. special kind of person to know something and to teach something. And that's, and again, I keep telling you, like, dude, you don't sell yourself high enough because you're just fucking, not only are you fucking top tier, like everybody thinks the top 10 things of the fucking UFC number six, will, you're number six, that'll surprise you. <laughs> and you can fucking teach it. Like, do you not realize how rare a thing that is like do you know i mean i'm i hope you know you know right i'm i'm uh i'm, I'm trying to explain that to other people so i get more clients <laughs> <laughs> here's the deal guys i am not the best at putting it into words but i'm fucking awesome <laughs> yeah. and i and so can you no i agree dude i love it dude just coming on to podcast with you to talk about random shit has been just a joy in my weekends, man. I'm, I can't <laughs> lie to you. No, it's uh, our uh, um, Rule Zero weekend mornings are awesome. Yeah, I gotta ask though. Are you are you smoking weed before you get on there? Because you're the chillest guy I've ever known. And I'm like, there's no, no way somebody can be this chill. <laughs> I do like. Uh, I mean, I've been I've been having like uh, upper thoracic neck problems for a long time, so I, I oh. You know, medicate some of the pain with uh thc cannabis but um yeah man i gave it up for the summer just to see if it was in my way <laughs> and yeah i get it no it didn't change anything it was just like it was like i stopped drinking coffee oh so you're <laughs> so you're literally the chillest man on earth i guess you could afford to be because you're like I could probably beat up everybody in this room. So I got no reason to worry. I take my time to probably take my time to process things and uh sort out my thoughts. I don't want to jump to any conclusions. Yeah. You know what? I like it. Honestly, it's the 
there needs to be more chill people. And I know I'm the guy, like I'm already two drinks in and I'm <laughs> hyper as fuck. It's like, and it's East Coast time, so it's like six in the evening. I basically, I'm that guy that goes to bed at eight and wakes up at four in the morning. I'm that fucking guy. And you right now are teaching me the true meaning of the word chill, and I like it. But no, I mean, as a teacher, though, that's a really good skill to have because you're patient. And I don't, does like, does this come through when you're teaching guys how to do this stuff, like patience? Because I know I, mean, I had that oh, problem when yeah. I was starting, where a lot of times I would learn a technique and I would rush it so fast when I kind of got to wait for the guy to start moving. And then once he moves, he creates space. And that's when I can move to get out of things. But I never did that. It got me into a lot of tap out situations, you know? No, yeah. I mean, being patient with students, especially because when I'm doing seminars, there's a there's a big um, there's a big curve between, you know, some of the beginners and some of the more uh, skilled athletes. And, mm -hmm. and you always have some people who just kind of don't listen. I feel like they don't they don't see the same reality. They see your, your body moving in a different way, and they don't don't understand what you're doing. But you definitely have to be on a higher level of uh, patience and understanding when you have you have a seminar yeah. going. Um, you know, patience as a father, I think, is something that luckily I've I've had a good amount of. And um, I, I was going to say, I've always been, a, always been a patient person. I've always I don't know, growing up as a country kid, just, you know, watching the grass grow sometimes is all there was to do some days. So can I ask where, where, where were you, like, where was your hometown and how big was it? We're a four in Indiana and it was about 185,000 people when I was growing up. Dude, that's huge. But it was spread out. It was really spread out. And, um, you know, it was half mile. Our neighbor's house was a half mile away type of stuff. Like there's a lot oh, of okay. farmland and, and Okay, that uh, makes sense then. Yeah. So my hometown, three thousand people. I've never seen an apartment until I was like in college. I never saw a stoplight till I was in college. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah three thousand so people. And my closest there, neighbor was like you, two K away, which I guess is like a two thirds of a mile. I can't yeah. convert into freedom units very well. <laughs> that makes sense though. Farm boy, dude, I can, I thought it was a country kid though. Yeah. Oh no. I thought, I thought it was a city kid until, um, until yeah, I, I moved out of, uh, Indiana to a real I city. Like, oh, shit. I was like, I'm a hell of country. <laughs> like, I'm really country. Well, I was going to yeah. say, tell me you have like an experience of helping a, helping a friend like load bales, square bales. Five bucks an hour. I used to bail hay. In the oh shit! My friend's dad's pig farm. You Dude, do you know why you were such a good fighter? Black right? stuff would just come out of your nose the whole next day. Yeah, that's the one. Be, this is why you're a good fighter. The, barn, the barn's like 108, 120 degrees, I think, in the top yeah. part because it's so humid. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, it's not just that. I mean, I guess I hopefully you got lucky and it was just dry bales, but I remember. The wrestler buddies I was telling you about, we had farm and they had a farm. And we used to help back and forth with each other. We had to hand bomb bales. I think I'm confident saying that your ability and your back strength came from you having to load bales like that. There is something about farm boy strength. I would say the top three types of strength. There's retard strength. There's like old man grip strength. And then there's like farm boy hay bale strength. And I, I have a feeling that's probably 80% of of the reason that you became as good as you came. <laughs> carry, carry shit, carry rocks around. I remember times, you know, that was the job was pick up, pick up these rocks there and carry them. Over oh, there. when they, when they, uh, yeah. When they till over the field for like a harvest. So you got to take all the rocks, throw them into the tractor, load mm -hmm. the tractor off. Oh dude, you are country. All right. never mind. 180,000 people. Hey, all you picked, uh, picked corn too. Picking corn. That was one. It was hard to like hold a basket and, Throw the corner at the same time, <laughs> but it's a good thing though. I don't think people get this well, either. Like, a lot of guys. Was, oh, sorry. Go, like, go. No, yeah, like working with your hands and like building stuff and like being outside and as good experiences. Like I wish. Well, I, I think had it's more stuff to take my kids to go and do that. You know, we used to too. It was uh, you know, this type of year before the snow started, before mm -hmm. Thanksgiving, we had to go and and get everybody situated with firewood. You know, so it's like 
the, the old guys would cut the trees down and cut the firewood up and then we'd stack up the firewood in people's cars and then we'd drive to somebody's house and then make sure aunt whoever had firewood for the whole winter <laughs> bringing over the truck load here has got three cords of firewood for you sweetie so dude always, that's awesome there's always some kind of like labor <laughs> well and this is what i like about it. i think this is what factors into you being so chill and a good teacher too because you've done hard work obviously you've done like what do we used to say like never make fun of a guy who digs ditches for a living like you've done your digging of ditches so when you're playing the ukulele which by the way if you guys haven't watched his show the john fitch knows nothing give it a shot man like i know you're used to like hey what's up youtube screaming guys but a chill guy with a ukulele and just chilling with you guys for two hours is deceptively fucking entertaining I've, i'm not gonna lie i've been like a quiet quiet observer for a while i have it on while i like, clean the house and shit sometimes okay i'll play i'll play a request for uh, uh super chats <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it's good because you're like all right i'm on camera i'm gonna teach you guys how to do basic fighting stuff i'm gonna play the ukulele i'm gonna do a podcast here but you're not one of those guys that like came from a middle class life nothing was really too hard so you kind of let it go to your head like you're very grounded and i think that's really helping as a teacher like you said you were saying patience and that's kind of why and i've seen dude i love country talk man i I hated being raised in a fucking small town, but I love talking about it. This is so much fun. <laughs> and no, he did not sprinkle too much alpha on it, either him or me. No, I, I, I yeah, that's one of the things that I kind of, I'm sad about my kids growing up. Not because they're not going to have that same experience that I had. Yeah. Kind of, you just, I just grow up. I, I go outside in the morning, eat breakfast, go outside in the morning on my day off, or in the summer or in the winter. You know, oh, and, uh, were your parents one of those don't come home until dinner types? Pretty much, as long as I was back for meals, my mom would. Oh, that's outside. awesome! I would, I would go outside. You know, we had seven acres, an old farmhouse, and then you go out, uh, outside the property line. And it was like a bunch of bunch of woods and fort. <clears throat> Excuse me, and um, a little creek. You go down there and build a dam all day Fucking at the creek. <laughs> you'd find, um, you'd find. Uh, like lost, overgrown junk piles. Right? We had a it'd junk carriage. It'd be an old car, an old '57 Chevy, rotted out, washer and dryer, and a bunch of broken glass bottles. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I'm having like major childhood flashbacks right now. The only thing you're missing is taking a skitter tire to go inner tubing down the river. That's the only thing you're missing. Oh, and maybe taking the four runner out or the four wheeler. They take a quad or a three wheeler. I don't know. Three wheeler or four wheeler? Yeah, three, What's I your wrote, preference? I've, I've ridden a three wheeler, three wheeler before. And you're alive to tell the tale, yeah. crazy bastard. <laughs> if you guys don't know in the chat, by the way, three wheelers were like death traps. Those were just, they flipped over at the Whoa. any chance, any turning. Yeah. yeah. He's trying to, yeah. I think my cousin like, kind of flipped it into the, off the hill into some trees. Yeah. I've done that. I flipped actually my four wheeler. I flipped that. I was taking a, I was going down a gravel, like a hill and I had to turn onto a side road. I raced down, slammed the brakes, turned sharp. The thing went ass over tea kettle flipped over me. Otherwise the thing would have crushed me. I bent the handlebars to shit. I told my mom about it when I was like 25. I was like 15 at the time. And she goes, I knew something was wrong with those fucking handlebars. Too. <laughs> I was like, how am I, how are we got dead right now? Anyway, I, whatever. I could talk about this shit forever. I want to talk about. Can I talk about the course some more? Okay. If you don't mind. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, guys, check it out. Like, dude, we put the links. I'm gonna keep peppering these links in here because I really do think it's worth it. Like, John, how else can I put this? People can learn from one of the greatest MMA fighters <laughs> in the world today. And yeah, the sport's only been around 30 years. I get it, but still, it's fucking impressive. Not only that, it's a pretty good price. And you're really good at teaching it because most guys aren't good at teaching it. So I would say give it a shot. If for no other reason, like, what do you think, John? Like, my takeaway from it is it's not so much teaching you how to be able to kill everybody in the room, but it's teaching you how to handle yourself, teaching you how to never oh, yeah. to be that guy that gets picked on at the bar. It teaches it's the guy also, that. It's also to help you start your momentum, give you some momentum because it's 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 six positions, seven techniques. Yeah. Yeah, they're simple to learn, easy to do. So you're, you're, you know, you can bridge that gap of like, ah, I feel I'm embarrassed because I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. <laughs> and it'll also show you that 
you um you are so much more capable from learning like a few easy things like the, mm -hmm. the seven techniques that i show you in the course if you learn those you'll be so much further ahead of other people like it'll blow you away like what else can i learn what else it's like getting a, a superpower oh give it right. give them yeah. a little taste so this is like yeah, crack you know, the first hit's free You're like oh wow it's like that was kind of easy to learn and then now people you you own your space people can't dominate you because i threw in some um you know people grabbing your wrist couple couple different ways they grab your wrist uh one way they could grab your elbow and they're kind of like they could be a physical threat because they want to fight you or they could be like a condescending asshole who's trying to punk you in front of other people yeah and if, and if you react like a spaz you look like a jackass right <laughs> Well, I guess here's the big question. You, Do you have if, something you know, in there how to handle the guy that gives that the, stupid the, hard handshake? <laughs> Probably not. But it's just, I, that's my always go to thinking like the asshole that tries to amog you in the group. Have you ever heard of amogging? Oh, you know amogging, yeah, right? I've heard of amogging, yeah. Yeah, that's what he's basically talking about, guys. Like, if a guy tries to amog you, how to handle it and not look like a fucking moron. Yeah. Grabs you by the wrist. Hey, buddy. Grabs you by the elbow. That's a common oh, one. I've seen that before in the club. Like, grab you by the elbow. Because if someone grabs you by the elbow, they can control like where your shoulders turn. So I could, yeah. I could, if I was standing over to your uh, uh, your left, I could grab your left elbow and, hey, buddy, I could say something insulting, just make you look silly. Yeah, move me and, around. Uh, and if, yeah, if you like fight back hard, like a spaz, people are like, what the hell's wrong with you? Well, it's like the the headlock's the other one. The control the head, the control the body, right? I'm sure you've had that one where the guy puts you in the headlock. Hey, how's it going? He's just roughhousing a little bit, but then you're the guy that's sitting there being ragdolled like a fucking asshole. I always Hell hated yeah. that one. So I covered three positions where the guy comes up from behind you and grabs you from behind. Ooh. Yeah. I can imagine, too. Dude, you know what I would love? Six months after you get this thing out and people get into it, some guy telling a story about how he almost gets mugged in Detroit. Somebody came up and behind him and he's like, John's course. I <laughs> just saved my life. Like fucking Robocop. I know that's going to happen. <laughs> I guarantee you no. And yeah, here, Danny's got the best point. Where is it? Is it coming yet? Yeah, there it is. Totally agree. Martial arts is addictive as hard drugs, but in a good way. He's not wrong. I've seen, cause that's usually the first thing we tell guys like a married red pill. My little purview is where guys have like dead bedrooms. Uh, my wife won't fuck me. What do I do? And like it, the only thing everybody can agree on is get to the gym, lift weights, and then like learn how to handle yourself in a fight. Take some MMA classes, yeah. something like that. And I've seen 80% of the time, the guy learns a little bit, he enjoys it and it carries over into his relationship. Mm -hmm. Like when you, like I told, we were talking stories about how like big guys like, drop something. on you, hurt your ribs. You have a purpose and you get yeah. excited about something like that's fun to be around. Some of you guys got positive fun energy. Yeah. And then if your wife's giving you shit and you're like, you know what? I think I'd rather go spar. At least then if I'm going to have my head hurt, it's because I want to get kicked in it as opposed to you nagging me. But it gives guys like a release while they work on themselves and fix their life and realize like sort out their fucking women in their life and. It's just a little thing. And a lot of these guys, I don't know if you notice this at your gym, but a lot of guys in our gym, it's like that was their only social outlet. Like just learning how to fight introduced them to a whole new world of people. And so then there was people they could have a commonality with. Like they can talk to somebody about MMA. They can talk to somebody about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. They could talk to somebody about Taekwondo or whatever. And it was like an instant thing. It's almost as good as having like a puppy or a tattoo. You know, where like as soon as you walk up to somebody, you're like, hey, it's like, or that soul open. patch. Like, dude, tell me about that thing. That's a 20 minute conversation. Yeah, it's an opener. It's a great way, especially if you're in a, a new town, joining a new gym. Yeah. Find, find what's going on around you. Well, I can imagine that too. If a guy comes to a new town, wants to join a gym, doesn't know what he's doing, you've at least given him enough tools that he doesn't have to sit there with like the. You know that basic bitch like this is how you throw a punch and then like guide your hand and you can at least get that embarrassing shit out of the way and learn the basics so by the time you get in there they could be like all right let's get into real shit it would be kind of nice but then again i don't know maybe they're the maybe i'm sure there's guys out there who were embarrassed to have to start from scratch but at least this way like yours is a, a video course so it's like you're learning the privacy of your own home 
Learn what get that embarrassment learn. out of the way and then take it from there. Yeah, I've been uh, doing a, a weekly class here at San Jose. I'm trying to build that up. It's very small right now, but I would like to be able to get um, my regular students like in positions where I can basically put them in a, in a bad spot and, and teach them how to fight out of it. <laughs> well, I could practice. see you honestly get like a uh... practical, some, you know, some practical usage to it. Not just like teaching my uh, uh, kata. Tell them to say hi yeah. Maybe I'll get one of those big, uh, big one of those big padded suits. Have them kick me in the nuts and stuff. <laughs> oh, dude! Oh, I this is gonna start some shit. But I gotta mention this: those big suits you were talking about. So there's this guy I used to work with. His name was Hunter, and he worked with that Florida convention. They brought you down there once, mm. and they filmed like a video on like to be a real man, and it was like the that tactical that fake tactical amusement park shit. And they put him in one of those big suits and sick like four Dobermans on him. <laughs> and I remember looking at that. I was like, holy shit, please don't be that guy, John. <laughs> they sick fucking dogs on me. This is alpha as fuck. <laughs> I hate the dogs. I don't get dogs sick on me. I, I'm with you. If, I'm, if they're going to put me in that Russian fucking bear suit, I want to have it because I have to go fight a bear for real, not because I want to get filmed getting beat the shit out of by some animals. <laughs> Don't be that guy. I wanna, I'm tempted to like. I want to fight the dog back, but I know you get in trouble for hurting the dog. Oh yeah, yeah, same. Yeah, but I'm like, choke, if I'm... I could choke slam a big dog. I think like, I don't know. Well, my dog, I got a 125 pound fucking monster right now. Oh. I still think I could take him. You might be able to, but not with a choke slam. Have you seen? I don't know what kind of dog your dog is. Was he a press? What kind of dog is it? Mary Mastiff. Oh, a Mastiff. Yeah, you just see his fucking neck. You're not going to choke slam shit. Yeah, he's got it. The best thing you got, and I'll say this is experience. I used to be raised around like German Shepherds. Is they have no lateral like stability at all. Like if you try to pull or push or squeeze the neck, you're fucked. What you got to do is just push him over sideways. But you know that if you've been on a farm life, you probably did you ever do any ranching stuff like branding or anything? No, I don't know. Oh, dude. Okay, the trick to it. Yeah, mostly we had mostly corn and soy fields around us. Yeah, typical soy. <laughs> All right, so I was a ranch. We had about five hundred head. Not a big ranch, but here's the trick, and it, you're gonna love this from an MMA perspective. If you have to wrestle a calf who weighs about two hundred pounds, you don't try and push it over. You don't try and get in a headlock. You don't try and hip toss it. You go across its side, reach across its stomach, grab its uh, right leg and right thing if you're reaching across there, touch the hooves together, and then you can just pick it up and like slam it to the ground. And now that's not in your course. This is like an added bonus for you guys for signing up early. And that's how you can fight you know, a calf because we, we know a lot of you guys are dating right now, so you'll need the information on getting a 200 pound cow on its side. <laughs> Came after the slump buster. You're savage, John. <laughs> you know what? Whatever. No judgment. You guys, sometimes you have to you have to fight for what you can get. Get the roll ball rolling again. <laughs> no shame, boys. No shame. <laughs> when it rains, it pours. You just gotta get you just gotta get the, the sprinkle started. Yeah. It, 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 you know what? Full disclosure, it kind of helps too. We're wrestling with your girl. Like my girl loves to wrestle with me, and I've found just the littlest bit of fighting knowledge made a huge difference because if you don't know what you're doing, it's really easy to hurt somebody when you're play fighting. Yes. That's and I know this is something you probably don't do as a sales pitch, but like just to know how to control your girl and throw her in a hip toss without smacking her head into the coffee table is a fucking superpower. Cause trust me, your night ends very badly. If you yeah, end up hurting her while she tries to grab you and throw you in a choke slam. That's my sales pitch. Be able to manhandle your woman without leaving any marks. <laughs> Show her who's boss. Yeah. <laughs> Teach her who's alpha. <laughs> oh, man. I, okay. I got to apologize now, John, because if you're going to get some like CTV or, or I guess uh, CNN thing, teaching people how to beat women, it's like, I'll own that. That was my fault. I'll put on the on air apology while you can go teach a course. Okay. Oh, yeah. Speaking of which, it's been a while. I got to put that on there. There we go. So guys, I'm throwing these in the chat. Do check them out. Like they are worth it. If you're even curious or on the fence, you can't go wrong. 
like I'm I've known John not as long Free as course. most people, but longer Check than it a lot. Out. Try yeah. it out. See what you think. I got other stuff on Gumroad also. You could look around. That's uh, not free, but this will get your feet wet. Yeah. And, and we have to, because I remember this. Do you remember, what was it? I can't remember which episode it was. It was like a couple weeks ago, but uh, somebody's like, man, this John guy is smart when it comes to fighting. He should write a book. <laughs> and you're like, I have two books. I have two books. <laughs> check this stuff out. Go check out his books, by the way. They're good. The I'm book. adding them to the library here. I'm waiting for them to come in, but you're going to like it. I mean, I, I know I'll like it. Just talking with you about this stuff is fucking amazing. Like your yeah, weight the, loss uh, Bible, I still swear by that thing. Yeah, you on the uh, meal plans. What's that? Well, the meal plans. My meal plans have to be a bit different, but only because like my girl is vegan. She had she mm. got that bacteria. You know the one that like red meat makes you sick. She caught that because her parents were snowbirds and she was born and raised in Mexico. And so they're like, hey, this red tide clams, let's feed that to a little four year old. And that made her sick. And then she's like, let's get her some street meat beef. And that made her sick. And so she eventually is like, I can't eat meat anymore. I'm like, well, that's fucking wonderful. I come from a place where I eat animals for spite because they're so stupid. And now I got this. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Wando. Wando, thanks for the two euro super chat. It's gonna have to report this one for advocating abuse. You know, the only thing you're gonna be abusing is uh is that uh is that cooch when you uh leave her shaking. I, I, I was trying to make that sound way slicker than it did. I'm sorry, John. Yeah, no, you and no avid tuber, you can't choke out a dog with a rear naked choke. Uh all right, so back to the course. So it's like maybe. Yeah, maybe. But seven was it seven? different situ or seven different situations or seven different uh, no, six, six situations seven different techniques or movements thank you there and the wrist one's the easy one so wrist elbow neck there's a couple there's a couple wrist a couple wrist ones there's an elbow grab then i got three people grabbing you from behind over both your <laughs> arms over one arm under both arms so here's my question for you on this one i'm obviously in canada where even our rough parts of town are pretty safe you're from the states california which when they say rough they're talking like mexican well, cartel it's rough. really safe like i i mean i put a tweet out the other day asking people what was today asking people when's the last time they saw a, a real fight out in the wild like hardly anybody <laughs> Most people, really you know i haven't seen tons of fights but it doesn't mean you shouldn't be ready for it if it happens yeah well i mean that's the the big thing it's not so much that it will happen but to being prepared if it is but i think isn't that the american spirit like you guys are like everybody has weapons ammo rifles whatever not because you're overthrowing the government next week but as like a last resort so you're you're as like a responsible american you're supposed to be prepared for shit, right yeah yeah as a responsible american responsible human being you, you yeah responsible to community you should be ready for shit to go down and I, I know where I'm going you with this. Shouldn't be a blubbering mess of uh, what do we do now? <laughs> yeah, and Should you know about the like, continuum right, of force, I assume, right? Nothing needs to be done. I'm gonna go do it. Exactly, but yeah, continuum of force. I know you know this one. You know this one, right? I think. Yeah, cops deal with this all the time. Military deals with this. If you guys oh, in the chat like don't the know, it's amount of force you use. Yeah, appropriate or one step above. It's just. There's an escalation. Same with like the DiCarlo mm -hmm. escalation ladder. If you want to touch a girl, what's the least sexy and the most fleshy place to touch her? Same thing with violence. Like first step is they call it officer presence. And so when John was saying, just know how to handle yourself. Don't look like a soft target. Shit like that will avoid like 90% of situations where you have to resort to things. And then it escalates all the way down to deadly force. And for open hand and closed hand stuff, this is before you have to like have a weapon or anything like that. So even if you're one of those guys that, you know, just in case the government gets tyrannical or if you just like being training, being very efficient with firearms. Yeah. It's always good before you have to go full Kyle Rittenhouse to yeah. maybe have a way to like stop a guy from coming up behind you and grabbing at you before you have to go and do well whatever you need to do because say what you will about that i know this is political but, but that's why say what I, you will I, about like whether he's right or he's wrong also. but that's a year of hell i don't want anybody to have to experience and your way way better from like a legal perspective you know yeah, avoidance. <laughs> yeah. avoidance don't be there foo avoidance don't be there just yeah let it burn yeah you're not you're not winning at this point 
But, but that's the point. It's like you said, once you know how to fight, people fuck with you less. So that situation just doesn't come up. Yes. And uh, the, like the continuation of force, like in those first three techniques, the wrist grab, the cross wrist grab, the elbow grab, yeah. that's a, that's a situation where you, you read those levels of force. Because somebody could just have been uh, touchy-feely and grabbed you the wrong way. Oh. Or they could be somebody who's looking to like shake you down and rob you. And you get the opportunity to feel how they react to your counter movements. Dude, that's you'll something I never even thought you'll, about. You'll see, you'll see quickly like how they escalate. If they fight you back hard, they step it back away, or if they move to try to uh, hit you or grab you or whatever, you know it's on. Dude, I never even thought about that part of it. Can I? Add, can you run your mouth about that for like five minutes while right. I listen intently and compliment it? <laughs> no, yeah, because sometimes <laughs> you don't you don't know the intention of people. You don't know where you're at. Like. We're talking about the AMOG stuff. You know, you, if you're at the club and you're talking to some pretty girls and some guy comes over and grabs you in a big, I call it like a big brother type of way. Pretty right. Little guy, you know, he grabs your elbow, grabs something to like kind of uh, punk you in front of the girls. Well, you don't know if this guy is just a jackass trying to punk you or he's drunk and doesn't know what he's doing or if he's, he's actually trying to fight you. Maybe he wants to punch you and you're not sure. So, yeah. You, you need to learn how to like put yourself into the best position possible to see what's going on in a situation. Situational because, awareness, dude. I never even want to thought yeah. about that. I hope you have that on the sales pitch for this shit because like, I know situational awareness, but I never thought of connecting it here. If you guys don't know that shit's important, like just knowing what's going around around you, knowing what the people are doing, it's a fucking mm -hmm. superpower. And it makes sense because, like you were saying, you're going through, I don't know how many repetitions you're going to have to do to learn your your techniques there. Like, I know your course is your course, but these guys are going to have to practice it on their own, like multiple yep. times until it's like All muscle time, memory. Constantly. Until it's just a part of who you are, just like, just like game. But yeah, but it'll be good because, like you said, guy just comes, gives you the big friend hug, tries to put you in like a nice loving headlock or whatever. You have no idea what he's in for, but you don't even have to think about it because it's just second nature. You'll try something out. Well, like you said, will he no, take a I step actually, back? A will he try to posture? Will he try to fight back? Will he back I, off? Was that, I had a client that was actually something that was a concern of his because he has like friends who are like kind of more macho or whatever than him. Yeah, yeah. And they'll like put him in headlocks and grab him and give him a noogie and stuff like that when they're out and they see him at the bar or whatever. So yeah. he's he, he he's insecure about it. Oh. Yeah. So then he gets anxiety and now he's like, has a hard time talking in front of girls and other stuff because his friend just like headlock and noogie them. <laughs> I don't know. For you, me, noogies you know? and wedgies, that's like such an 80s thing to do. <laughs> yeah. It's like, like, uh, so it's like a thing. It's like, hey, like, okay, well, here, it grabs you, grabs you by the head, grabs you in a certain way. Do this. Fight back. It's a playful way of like, no, you can't do that. You can't own my space. You can't, you know, noogie me. You're without asserting getting, boundaries. Without get, with, yeah, you're asserting boundaries without getting like, like, aggro or like fucking, you know, popping a vein. Getting oh. mad. You're playfully asserting your space. That's kind of what it is. It's they're 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 testing the hierarchy. It's like monkeys, like fucking, you know, throwing fucking bugs and shit at each other and like <laughs> seeing, oh, hey, what's up, bud, and and whatever. Like you need to be able to to playfully assert yourself back and be like, no, you can't, you can't turn me into a little bitch. Dude, this is the most red pilled thing you've said in the last hour. I'm not even joking. There is a great Athel K uh, post that Ian Ironwood talked about. I know you don't know who these guys are. They, they were like pre Rolo red pill. That's how old they are mm -hmm. talking about what to do when the other guy tests you first. And they were telling a story about, uh, a field report of a guy at a barbecue. Same thing. This other dude keeps emasculating in front of his friends. He just kind of laughs it off, doesn't know what to do. Eventually, the guy went and started like uh, chatting up the, the the husband's wife. Luckily, he had a friend who was like you said. He's like, you he knew how to establish a space, stuff like that. He kind of got in there. The guy got a little touchy with him. Like, you know, friendly touchy, but not friendly touchy. 
And he was just able to like assert himself like that. Of course, he also followed up with, if I ever see you on this property again, I'm going to beat the shit out of you. But <laughs> I think that threat wouldn't have mattered if he wasn't able to assert his space while he did it. And so it's just, I like these connections, man. Like little yeah. things. So like, I'm just at a barbecue with friends. It's like the most casual thing ever. But yeah, just being able to know how to stop a guy from like enforcing it's, your boundaries so I can hit like, on your friend's yeah. wife is like such a thing. The Peterson, the Jordan Peterson uh, story stuff, like the guy, the new guy on the on the job, and people were throwing stuff at him and dinking things off his on his helmet. Oh see, yeah, see what happens. Like same thing. There's they gotta fuck with you, and if you react in like a crazy way, if you freak out, well, uh, you lose out because now you're the crazy person. You're ostracized. Yeah. And if you it's insecurity too, you, that's why uh, you have to if over. You, if you underreact, if you don't do anything, the bullying just gets worse. And it's you're calibration for being how to adequately worse. react. Yeah, so it's like you got you got to find somewhere in the middle. You can't do nothing, and you can't overdo it. So you got to like find that sweet spot. Dude, I like that. I really do because I think a lot of guys. Well, I don't, I don't know if a lot of guys, but I know some guys, they think about learning how to fight. They think about it's just, just learn how to punch properly and then hit him in the face and knock it out. And I think they're missing all the mental games that are involved in it. Like, I'm sure you've seen this in your career, and I'm sure it comes through on how you're teaching, where sometimes just by the way you approach things, like you said, if some guy is just fucking with you, throws you in a headlock, grabs your elbow to kind of push you around to, to punk on you, just you knowing what you're doing and establishing you have like space control sets mm -hmm. him off. Like that, that can fuck with the guy's head. It He's sends, like, oh, it, I can't sends, really it sends, fuck with sends a message. It's like just knowing how to move. Like, yeah, even somebody who doesn't really understand grappling or fighting, like you can feel like a dominant body. Like you feel dominant position standing next to certain people in certain and it's ways. subtle so like the girls around you don't think oh he's just going to be a violent asshole i better get mm -hmm. away from him they don't know what's going on they just think you guys are having fun and all of a sudden he's like becoming your best friend when he was bullying you a second ago yeah yeah, yeah. They, they don't it doesn't register to them there you guys go you want to know how to get the girls here get your buddy out of a headlock <laughs> All right, I I don't I don't know how long you want to do this. I don't know. Do you have dinner or something? I only have this scheduled for an hour. Are you fine with that? Or yeah, hour's good. I got right. a, uh, getting ready. I have my I have a class, a self defense class tonight at six here uh, on the left coast in San Jose. All right, let's end it with it. Okay, I'm gonna end it on something, John. I think a lot of guys, especially from the Rule Zero, and a lot of guys in the chat, they don't know you very well. I want you to tell your best farm boy story. Tell me about the worst you ever got hurt. Tell you the, my okay. story is I got hit by my own tractor. I want to hear your version of, I got run over by my own tractor. Do you have one? No, I don't know. I, I, uh, never got hurt the, on the farm. Fuck off. No, I got hurt all the time, but I was like, we weren't farming. Like the, we had an old broken, it was like an old, uh, retired farm. It was like old, you know, it was an old farmhouse and some land, but like we know he was farming. I had to, mow the grass and shit like that which took a whole saturday but um no man i i never had any crazy big injuries luckily like my really my broken arm came from my brother and his friend falling off the couch when they're wrestling <clears throat> okay like my I, brother I, broke I, his I've arm got, same I've way got, <laughs> i've got tons of uh cuts and scars and stuff like that from falling and, and whatever but um yeah, I made out pretty good. I didn't lose an eye. I used to go hunt with my BB gun all the time. Had my bow and arrow shooting that thing around all the time. Oh, you were a bow hunter? Um, I had a bow and arrow. Oh. <laughs> compound or normal? Uh, well, I had like a kid's compound bow. And then when in high school, I borrowed my buddy's compound bow. And uh, I never even shot it at an animal. I tried to oh. shoot some, I tried to shoot some raccoons. That's a good, I mean, that's a good farm story for you. It's my battle with the raccoons. They, uh, <laughs> yeah, we moved back into this, this, this house back in the woods. And, um, we had some neighbors, the raccoons would come and get into our, our garbage and spread shit all over the place. So, yeah. um, I had the bright idea that I was gonna, I was gonna exterminate our little pesky neighbors. And, 
I'd set the, the the fog lights up at night when I got back from being out or whatever. So it's like three in the morning. And I put a little cat food on the edge of the property. <clears throat> and I I just sit there in my little chair and, and <laughs> wait for the raccoons to come. And I got a few shots off like the first night, but you know, they didn't come. And then uh you know, the next night I was out there and one kept I kept seeing one like really clear. He was like coming yeah, yeah. out and like he's fucking with you. <laughs> you know, and I was like, man, I got I wanna get him, I wanna get him. And then after about like two hours of me like trying to get this guy, I think I shot once or twice. Um I hear the garbage can fall over. So <laughs> the one was distracting me while his buddies like circled all the way around the house. Oh, uh, dude, like Jurassic Park other, style? Yeah, I came around to the other side to push the garbage cans over. Oh, I'm going to meme this. Yeah. I'm going to meme this, that scene from Jurassic Park with the clever girl and the velociraptors. That's going to be you hunting the raccoons. That's awesome. Was, man. <laughs> I, uh, I tipped my hat to him. I went to bed. I was like, you in. All right, so there you guys go. The only person who's beat John in a fair raccoon. match was a fucking raccoon yeah. in Indiana. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So, anyways, yeah, so this was the this is the hour with John. Hope you guys enjoyed it. His Gumroad course it's in the description. If you're watching this after the fact, I'm putting it in the chat for you guys. Go check it out. Even if you're not interested in it, it's again very basic fighting stuff. As you can see, the residual effects are more than just learning how to fight. It's not just learning how to fight. It's learning how to control space. It's learning how to get you know to get playful with other guys without looking like no bitch. It's a way of handling yourself without like freaking out the chicks that you're trying to mack on or freaking out your wife it's a way of handling yourself with better composure it's a it's an entrance exam to the wonderful world of being injured every day because you want to train mma in your spare time all of that stuff and even if you don't like any of that yeah and even if you don't like any of that weight loss bible go get that is it on this it's on the same gumroad page isn't it it's also on amazon i know but Uh, it's on amazon it's not on gumroad yeah Check that one out, by the way. It's I gotta, I gotta super link useful. In my descriptions too. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, that's all right. Just send me links of whatever. I'll make sure it's in the description here for you. Check that shit out, guys. I guarantee you won't be disappointed. I don't trust many people with the ability to like break a wrist lock, but I think John's a safe one. And uh, I got nothing else. Do you got anything else to end this off on before I hit the button? No, uh, I just put my uh, link tree in the description, so there's other other stuff in there they can access. Oh. Dude, that's smart. I'm going to steal that, put in a thing. All right, there's the link tree. 